All right, it is late at night on Tuesday, March 21st. I'm gonna continue on with my charismatic research and I am just finding this absolutely fascinating. You literally see as you read through this, you see the beginnings of another church developing inside the Roman Catholic Church. They have their own sacraments, right? Sacrament of baptism in the spirit, which is an inversion of the true baptism where the priest lays hands on the people. Well, in their case, it's the lay people laying hands on the priests. Okay, so it's a complete inversion of baptism. You have inversions of pilgrimages now. We're going to see that tonight. Um, so instead of pilgrimages to holy places, their, the, their movement was born out of pilgrimages to universities. And to be honest with you, they would have been better off taking um, pilgrimages to universities to learn about, like, I don't know, history of the church or knowledge of the sacrament, something along those lines. Um, they would have been better off doing that, like going to those kind of seminars rather than what they did. You see, we're going to see an inversion or, or the beginning of false Marian worship. We're going to see the beginning of their prophecy movement. They're all very big into prophecy. And you're going to see there's there was hints at the very beginning stages of um, this spirit, if you will, what they're identifying as the Holy Spirit. And it's not the spirit of Pentecostalism or whatever, um, starting all of these um, wild prophecies about uh, the the age of peace. You're going to, because Fatima gets brought up specifically. And so instead of um, how Our Lady of Buenos Successo tells us in the 1600s, right, that the church will be restored when it's the darkest, there will be a great war. The clouds will dissipate that cover the church um, due to Freemasonry. And there will be, um, and by the way, a, the, the main error of Freemasonry is indifferentism, okay? And so that's exactly what this movement promotes. You don't need the Catholic Church to be saved. Why? Everybody gets baptized in the Spirit. You don't have to be Catholic to receive the Holy Spirit. Really? Oh boy. That's um, not what the Church has ever taught. Um, where was I going with that? So, yes, instead of a restoration, um, they call it a renewal where everything, you know, things are going to be transformed and, and just the living in the divine area. You've all heard it. I don't have to go over it. Just listen, <laughs> the restoration is going to come through much blood and sacrifice. At this point, that's the only way it can come about. The people who are left to rebuild the church will be the ones who know the church, who understand the church teachings, not the ones who are off doing basically seances and <laughs> channeling spirits, because that's all this is. <laughs> like, those are not going to be the ones that rebuild the church, I promise you, okay? So just listen to what I'm saying. It's so obvious to me at this point. Like I'm, I, like I said, I'm in utter amazement of how this set itself up within the Catholic Church pretty much not inhibited whatsoever. It's really amazing to me and not in a good way. Um, it makes me sad because it's taken over the whole church. It's the dominant force. It's the dominant spirit in the church. This whole idea of you could, religion doesn't matter. You can worship at the altar of whatever as long as you're a good person. You can receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, it's, it's nonsense. It's not true. It's not what the church has ever taught. The church has always taught there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church. And that is a very uncomfortable topic for the charismatics. Let me tell you. They will try to wiggle out of it any way they can. Um, but anyway, so let's continue on here. The last time we left off, I think we left off with our priest friends attending a prayer, me uh, prayer meeting and um, having hands laid on them. And that's a common theme. We're going to see it many more times. That was not a unique, isolated incident. Um, next we see the next meeting was held four days later in the oldest building at the Notre Dame campus with over 30 people in attendance. Some suggested that the bishop should be informed. And the bishop was informed and replied as follows on March 25th, 1967. The situation which your letter describes is beyond me. I suppose it requires one charism to recognize another. And so here's the thing. Um, bishops actually 
should, if he knew what he was doing, um, have the charism to discern events in their diocese. That's actually one of the charisms associated with their office, if you believe what Father Ripberger says. So anyway, there are cases on record in which the gift of tongues has been clearly identified with diabolical possession. Of course, I'm making no such judgment, or any judgment at all, in the present instance. I intend to discuss this matter matter further with Bishop W, name blocked out, and I shall appreciate any further report you you may have. A blessed Easter to you in the Lord, Leo A. Pursley. The next week, the group seems to be living in two different worlds, They pursued their their daily routine and met two or three times a week to pray in the strange new power of the spirit. The students did not know how to integrate this new power into their lives. The question arose whether it was better to tell other people what was happening or to remain quiet until it became clear just what all this meant. One of the priests recommended the latter, but no such advice was followed. Because they can't stop talking. (laughs) Um, let me go back. Sorry, I am borrowing this book from um, archives.com, so it has to keep renewing it every hour. And if somebody else checks it out, I can't read it, but luckily it's not a popular one. So, so far I haven't had much trouble. Okay, so I wanted to bring up a couple more points. Um, a man named Jim lost the faith. And a man named Bert was trying to get him converted. And so that's cool, right? You should e- evangelize um, our fallen away brothers and sisters. However, he did not even he didn't try to evangelize him to the faith. He tried to evangelize him to the new faith um, with the initiation rite being baptism in the spirit. <laughs> so anyway, um, let's try to find it. Okay, so that afternoon, Bert went first to the chapel and on sudden inspiration. And by the way, I'm reading from the Pentecostal Movement in the Catholic Church by Edward D. O'Connor. He was a priest um, and he was one of the early theologians to lend credibility to this movement. So he is charismatic friendly, probably up until he resigned, then maybe not so much. But at this particular point, he was. So that afternoon, Bert went first to the chapel and on a sudden inspiration made the way of the cross, something he had not done for a long time. At each station, he meditated on the scriptural accounts of the crucifixion, and this imprinted several of the texts deeply on his mind. Then he called on Jim, who welcomed him with a feeling of great inner dismay. Bert had arranged for another friend to join them and for all of them to go to the office of one of the priests in order to pray over Jim. Oh, and there's something else I wanted to bring up from Father Ritberger's um, book called Dominion. He says people who are obsessed often have unnaturally strong passions. The demons will allow a person to feel good things, even holy things. My emphasis, um, my words, holy things, because... Saints have told us that in the past, um, and maybe I'll dig up a, a few good works on that. But Saint Saints, Satan will, um, he can inspire feelings of devotion, feelings of holiness, if it's for a ultimate end that's not good, some disordered end. But anyway, so the demons will allow a person to feel good things to gain greater control over them. It's why a lot of times if Catholics go to a... Um, even uh, a Protestant service, you know, a Protestant non-denominational or something, Satan can can inspire them or can affect them with emotions, um, you know, what they would consider godly emotions. And it's to draw them away from the Catholic faith. So I've had this exact talk with um, people in my family who've had this happen to them. They, they, um, as, as children, as teenagers, strayed away from the Catholic faith, went to a non-denominational, went up to the altar call, said um, they were prayed over, felt the hand of God, felt warmth and peace, the hand of God, joy, never to return to the Catholic faith, didn't raise their kids in the faith, et cetera, et cetera, never been married validly in the church. Very scary. Very dangerous, very scary and very dangerous. But that's what the spirit is all about, apostasy. 
revolt against Christendom, revolt against Christianity, revolt against the Roman Catholic Church specifically. Okay, so, um, so I'm not impressed basically is my point with the fact that you have fervent devotion because ultimately in the end, um, you are being used to set up a new religion <laughs> inside the one true religion. So just hear me out. Um, all right. So he made the way of the cross, something he had not done for a long time. At each station, he meditated on the scriptural account of the crucifixion in this imprint. All right. So Bert had arranged for another friend to join them and for all of them to go to the office of one of the priests and listen to how disordered this is, y'all, in order to pray over Jim. The priest was occupied and they had to wait half an hour. While they waited, Bert began to read the story of the Passion aloud. As the reading progressed, Jim, who up to this point had simply consented numbly to everything, began to grow agitated. He moaned and shook his head. The stupidity of Peter in cutting off Malachus's ears seemed to disturb him particularly. Finally, the priest called to say he was free and Jim, feeling like a prisoner on the way to execution, followed his two friends to the office. There they urged him to commit his life totally to Christ and began to pray over him. Like, it's so pushy. Like, what? despite all his distress and confusion, Jim was entirely amused, entirely amused by the absurdity of the scene. His two friends were praying over him in unintelligible tongues. Check this out. The priest stood over in the corner saying the rosary. While Jim himself sat in a chair crying. To me, this sounds like a, like inverted exorcism or something. Like the priest is over in the corner with the rosary. And these two are praying over a man who's clearly having some spiritual issues. Like, <laughs> what? In spite of all that, and deeply conscious of the terrible seriousness of his act, he called upon Jesus to be his Lord and surrendered his life to him. Okay, that sounds pretty Protestant. He did not say this out loud in words. Well, that part's not Protestant. But seized a crucifix lying on the desk and began to kiss it fervently. In a sense, nothing whatsoever happened to him at that moment. Those who were with him observed no change interiorly. However, the peace of Christ had descended upon him. And again, this is all subjective. It was like nothing he had ever, it's all feelings, emotions. And when we read further on, y'all are going to see how this is like Catholic Woodstock. Like, I'm not even joking. It's so strange. And I, I'll be honest, I pray, thank God that I was not born during that time because I would not have done well. I swear I am allergic to hippies. I'm allergic to the way they smell. I don't like their music. I can't handle their, the way they talk. Like, I'm allergic to hippies. But that's what is happening. So there's like this hippie Catholicism. <laughs> just developing this hippie hippie catholicism religion developing within the infrastructure of the roman catholic church it's wild i mean it's trippy if you want to use a term from the 60s or 70s <laughs> all right so anyway he felt amazing he knew that god existed and he felt amazed that jesus would give would make such a gift to one who had been as hostile as he had been, and he felt a desire to learn more about him. And so then it stops, right? So it's like, felt a desire to learn more about him. How? Like within the tradition of the church or another way? Like that's what, I, it's just never clear. And so with these people I found a lot of times, it's not so much what is said, is what it, it is um, what is not said, and what is emphasized. And so there's this huge emphasis on the Holy Spirit, right? But it's unbalanced. And so I agree with um, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, where he says we need to um, help our charismatic friends become a little more balanced in their approach. Because they focus on the same things Protestants focus on. Scripture, the Holy Spirit, Jesus. If they do um, have a devotion to Mary, it always has a... Um, it's never about like the scary, like the pick up your cross parts of Mary's messages and things like that. Um, and as far as like understanding, like the theology behind Mary, it's shaky at best. Um, so it's always about the the feelings associated with Mary as a mother. or It's just, and like, I guess the rosary, okay, that's fantastic. Y'all know I promote the rosary, but how are you meditating upon the rosary? Or... 
even Joe Biden wears a rosary. Like, so that's, again, uh, great. That's a good thing. Keep doing it. Um, but maybe in your rosary meditations, go back and, and get these meditations from old school saints like St. Louis de Montfort or whoever else. Um, that's all I'm saying. So anyway, for several days, Bert would visit Jim each day and usually would read to him some passage from scripture that he had received through prayer. So again, it's not like some systematic approach to helping him rediscover the faith by reading the catechism or anything like that. It's um, whatever Bert is inspired to proclaim. The first time he did this, the passage was like an answer to a question with which Jim had been struggling. Then I knew why scripture says that the word of God is like a two-edged sword, he says. Several days later, he went to confession and immediately afterward received the baptism in the spirit. And again, there's no real like description of that. As this story illustrates, preoccupation with the Holy Spirit did not turn people's attention away from Jesus Christ. But I disagree. What Jesus are they talking about? Again, the Protestants have a serious fixation on Jesus, the Jesus that they don't know because they're not in his church. In the words of my patron saint, St. Joan of Arc, she said, all I know, I'm paraphrasing, but she says, all I know is that Jesus and his church are one in the same. You don't know him if you don't know his church. It's that simple. There's no salvation outside the church. There's no full knowledge of him outside the church. It's one in the same. So they think they know some version of him. Okay. In the initial excitement over the charisms, there was some tendency to focus on the latter in separation from the total Christian mystery. The danger, danger of such a temptation was, however, sensed almost immediately and from very early days, the ad, uh, admonition was frequently voiced. We have not been called to bear witness to the gifts, but to G Jesus Christ as Lord. People reminded themselves that the Spirit was given in order that Jesus might be glorified. Many came to realize that their relationship with Christ was not all it should be, and they took the steps towards ne steps necessary to rectify it. Hence, the overall effect of the gifts was to convince people, ready? was to convince people that Jesus is alive today and reigning with power. Yes, in his church. See, it's what they don't say. One of those who had attended... The March 4th meeting at the Rannigans, on which the um, Duquesne events were first publicized in the Notre Dame community, was a young man named Ernie, a graduate student and teaching assistant at the university. I really hope that he's making these names up because we're going to see Bert and Ernie. <laughs> I just can't take it. He was at once he was at once a devout Christian. And I don't know if that means like a Catholic or whatever, um Protestant. But um a careful thinker, not lightly given to bursts of enthusiasm or flights of imagination. And you're going to see his whole personality change. And so that's like another thing. Like the personality doesn't um, change that drastically and that suddenly if it's the Holy Spirit. Like that's not how it works. Maybe the actions do. Um, fleeing from sin, things like that. But if you're... Yeah, so the, okay, hold on. Let me just get through this. The Duquesne story left him quite skeptical. All right, so Bert and Ernie, here we go. Bert convinces him anyway because Bert's pushy to come not to go to, to come to a prayer group, okay? So Bert and two others escorted him um, to the room of one of the priests, again, who had been attending the prayer meetings. And with no other preliminaries, they had him sit down and began to pray over him. Within a minute or so, a disconcerted look came over his face, and his lips seemed to twitch a little. When the prayer was over, the others sent him into the next room to pray alone by himself, so that he would not be intimidated by their presence. Meanwhile, they sat down to discuss the letter that was to be sent to Bishop Pursley, which has already been mentioned. The priest began to read a rough draft that he had composed, which contained the statement, 
I have never witnessed anyone receiving the gifts of tongues. He had just read that when they were startled by a strange sound coming from the next room. It seemed to be a kind of oriental music, the sort that is played in movies as sound effects for snake charmers. <laughs> what? <laughs> or Indian bazaars. How did this guy write this with a straight face? There has been several times where I've had to go look this up because I'm like, this is a joke. Like, this is like, like candid camera. Like, this isn't. This is their real literature, though. Yeah, like, this is really what happened. Okay. So, snake charmers and Indian bazaars. And he says, well, I guess I'll have to scratch that line, said the priest. And they all cracked up with laughter as the singing got louder and louder. After a few moments, it stopped. And as everyone struggled to regain his composure, in walked Ernie with a dazed look on his face as if he had been clubbed over the head. It just started coming out, he stammered. I didn't think I could sing that high, but it kept getting higher and higher. This was only the second instance of singing in tongues that occurred in this group. However, nearly all who received the gift of tongues received sooner or later the ability to sing in their tongue also, as will be explained more fully in chapter 4. Not everyone who was prayed over experienced such immediate and manifest effects. In fact, those who did were the exceptions. But from time to time, these dramatic cases occurred as if signs from God that his power was unabated. If that is the power of God, y'all, uh, then we've been had because, <laughs> wow. Okay, so Easter, um, nothing really. Easter, the Sunday, okay, here's where this was interesting. The Sunday after Easter, a memorable meeting occurred. Some of the students were still absent, including the one who had been leading most of the meetings thus far. The latter stayed away on account of what he felt to be an impulse of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, several strangers were present, and the meeting began so slowly and hesitantly that many who were there felt some anxiety about how it would turn out. A reaction that was not rare in the early months. So apparently, um, anxiety. Then, quite unexpectedly, Ernie, the one whose story was told above, closed his eyes and began to speak aloud in tongues. This was the first time that such a thing had occurred in this group until then the gift of tongues had been used only in personal prayer. Later on, and I just don't know how people take this here. I'm, I, later on in the evening, Ernie explained that he had been resisting an urge to speak out in this way all during the first part of the meeting. Not until someone remarked that all our gifts should be used for the sake of the community because it's spiritual communism. Did he take courage and follow the impulse within him? Everything must be shared. That's why they can't shut up. At the moment, however, no one else was aware of this. They all sat in silent wonder. After a few moments, Kevin pointed out that the Holy Spirit sometimes gives someone a message in this fashion, which someone else is then inspired to interpret, as can be seen in 1 Corinthians 14, 5, 13, and 26 through 28. If therefore anyone has received the interpretation of this message, he should speak out. Still, there was silence. Next, Kevin suggested that someone might have received the interpretation without realizing what it was. <laughs> so we have this thing in the um, interrogation world, right? So as part of our continuing education, sometimes I take classes on interrogation or interviewing people or whatever. And this is so suggestive. Like talk about things you're not supposed to do when you want to get an honest answer. It's this, suggesting things. <laughs> he urged that anyone who had thoughts going through his mind at the moment the message was being given, declare them. Jim, the student whose conversation was narrated above, spoke up hesitantly. While Ernie was speaking, he said, the words, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, kept running through my head. Then with a surprising note of assurance suddenly coming into his voice, he added, I felt moved to tell you all what, what Mary promised at Fatima is really going to take place. He himself did not know what the Fatima promises were. And one of the vision, uh, one of the visitors who was at the prayer meeting for the first time, an immigrant from Poland, gave a brief but moving summary of them. For a while after that, the conversation centered on Mary. The first time this subject had ever come up at one of the prayer meetings. 
One of the women declared that she had always felt a great repugnance for devotion to Mary, but that since receiving the baptism in the spirit, she had become much more open to it. Then one of the men remarked that the words, God is with you forever, had been in his mind while Ernie was speaking in tongues. It struck one of those present that this was nothing but a paraphrase of Gabriel's words to Mary. So apparently the Holy Spirit doesn't get the Hail Mary right. Um, The Lord is with thee. But at the moment he said nothing. Later on in the evening, among the people who were prayed over for the baptism in the Spirit, there was a priest. Okay, so again, we see lay people praying over priests in this version of spiritual communism. Afterward, he declared that while Ernie was praying over him in tongues, he distinctly heard the words um, Chare Maria, the Greek for Hail Mary. This was the first time that any of the charismatic tongues had been identified, and everyone marveled, especially Ernie, who had never learned a word of Greek in his life. Then someone observed, That when the three words received that evening were put together, they formed a rough summary of the angelic salutation. So apparently the Holy Spirit could not get across the whole Hail Mary. So we have Hail Mary, God is with you forever. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Not until the following day on which the Feast of the Annunciation was celebrated did it occur to anyone that the prayer meeting had been held on the vigil. Ordinarily, the Annunciation is celebrated on on March 25th, but in 1967, Holy Saturday had fallen on that date, and the Annunciation had been postponed to April 3rd. The group had, therefore, unwittingly been holding a vigil service of this feast and had received in tongues the substance of the very prayer by which the angel Gabriel's original announcement to Mary is commemorated in the church. So my first thought is, obviously, this is the beginning of false Marian devotion and false prophecies that twist Fatima that we see everywhere. Um, But my other thought is maybe, just maybe, at Notre Dame University, right, they had a, that was a warning to them to cut it out um, from Mary. Um, I don't know. Could go either way. Prior to this meeting, there had been very little evidence of devotion to Mary and the Pentecostal group. Many members of the group did not carry a rosary, and some never recited one. From this meeting, however, there resulted a noticeable um, impetus to Mary. Piety, although it affected people in quite diverse ways, some who had been devoted to Mary found their devotion deepened and intensified. And again, this is all subjective. There's no details on it. Some um, who had felt a strong apathy for this devotion now found that they could understand and perhaps even accept it. Understanding is good. One young man who had been relatively indifferent in the matter now found in himself a warm affection. Again, there's warm and fuzzies for the mother of the Lord that has remained a prominent trait in his spiritual life ever since. Next, we continue on and we will see our pilgrimages. Now we're having pilgrimages to the holy site of Notre Dame University or sorry, Michigan State Weekend. For about a month, news of the foregoing events, I'm sorry, it was uh, Michigan State Weekend at Notre Dame, I believe. For about a month, news of the foregoing events spread quietly from person to person by word of mouth, especially among those who had already been linked together through the Antioch weekends. Excited rumors carried the news to still further circles, but the general public remained quite unaware of what was going on. The end of this quiet state of affairs was um, brought about by the so-called Michigan State Weekend of April 7th through 9th. It originated, ironically, in the suggestion that the group hold a quiet retreat in order to get its bearings. No one was quite sure about the meaning of the things that were happening. Um, So obviously they were all very disoriented. Or what human um, initiatives, if any, should be taken in response to them. Before things advanced any further, therefore, it seemed good to have a weekend of prayer and reflection. There would not be a preacher, however, for who would be able to give directions when they were all in a state of wonder. Exactly. No need for any preachers to make sense of this. There's no need for priests because everybody just receives the Holy Spirit and is in a state of wonder. (laughs) A few days before the weekend was to begin, a call came from Steve Clark and Ralph Martin in East Lansing, Michigan. They were well known to many of the people of Notre Dame. Um, And then it goes on to give their background. They were 
majored in philosophy, yada, yada, um, made a retreat at the Monastery of Mount Savior in New York during the summer of 65, and they decided to devote their lives fully to the apostolate. They began working for the National Secretariat of the Crisillo Movement in Lansing and soon became actively involved in the student parish at Michigan State University. Steve and Ralph remained in close contact with their friends at Notre Dame in Duquesne. It was Steve who had discovered. This was fascinating. So Ralph Martin's buddy Steve was the one responsible for discovering the cross and the switchblade. And if you remember from the beginnings of these videos, um, that was the book that was prime, one of the primary factors that influenced the students of Duquesne University, um, which led to them seeking baptism in the spirit from Episcopal heretics, Episcopalian heretics, and bringing all that heresy back to the university. And the cross and the switchblade, by the way, is, a Protest is written by a Protestant person, a Protestant pastor, I guess. So... It was Steve who had discovered David Wilkerson's book, The Cross and the Switchblade, and drawn it to the attention of the others. This had been an important factor in preparing the ground for the Pentecostal movements. When the latter got started at Duquesne, Steve and Ralph were there at once to be prayed over. So Ralph Martin was at Duquesne University immediately to be prayed over. They received the gift of tongues and since then have been spreading the good news of the spirit in the Lansing area stop there for a minute. So not necessarily the good news of Jesus Christ and his church, the sacraments, things like that. The good news of the spirit. Yikes. They had heard about the planned retreat and were calling to announce that a group would be coming down from Michigan State to join in on it. This news created some consternation at Notre Dame, where no one was quite sure what was going to happen at the retreat anyway. It also increased the excitement. On a hilariously confused Friday night, 45 people from the Lansing area arrived in cars at all hours of the night while a sentry posted at the university entrance, waited to meet them and direct them to the quarters that had been arranged for them wherever a spare bed or corner of a rug was available. The majority of them were students, but others were townspeople from Lansing and elsewhere. Um, okay... About 40 people from Notre Dame took part in the retreat along with 45 from Michigan. It got underway late Friday evening in a third floor classroom at the administration building. This grimy, unattractive location was chosen simply because it was one of the largest rooms on campus and was readily available. The first meeting opened with a meditative biblical rosary, they say, and several brief talks followed by a get acquainted period. That was somewhat stiff and awkward for many of the newcomers. After the meeting dissolved, some people were prayed over privately, and a few received the baptism in the spirit, although this was not generally known. Saturday morning, Mass was celebrated in a chilling wind at the Grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes on the campus, and there were small group discussions, some of which still went rather stiffly. The afternoon sharing session started out about the same, and a sense of uneasiness was beginning to settle upon some of the group. Was the whole retreat going to go like this? So apparently they were not there for the rosary and the mass because they were bored by it. Then a nun rose impulsively and declared, I would like to be prayed over for the baptism in the spirit. That broke the ice. Others joined in on the same request. They took chairs around the center of the room and those who wished to pray over them went around from person to person, mostly in groups of two or three in a loose, unorganized way. And this will be a common theme as well. It's always chaotic and unorganized and disordered. News of this meeting had reached some of the Pentecostal churches in South Bend, and several of their members had come out to observe it. They joined in. So here's your ecumen ecumenicalism, right? They joined in the praying with an exuberance that surprised and disturbed many of the Catholics who were not accustomed to such a style of prayer. Nevertheless, despite all the confusion and misgivings, a number of people were powerfully touched by the Spirit. That afternoon, in a deep sense of joy and love, was communicated to the entire group, melting it into a unity. So union with the heretics, how lovely, how loving, so loving. 
when the activity had subsided, one of the Pentecostal visitors arose and declared in the warmest tones, brethren, well, first of all, we're not your brethren because um, you have separated yourselves from the body of Christ. I can't tell you. This, this cracks me up. I was dying. I was laughing like a lunatic over here. Brethren, I can't tell you all how happy I am to see that Catholics can receive the Holy Ghost too. <laughs> One of the visitors from South Bend was Douglas Weed, whose father Roy was pastor of Calvary Tabernacle, the largest Assembly of God church in the South Bend area. Douglas was skeptical about Catholics receiving the Holy Spirit and came to see for himself. <laughs> He was also a bit fearful about what kind of reception he might get. Yeah, because they hate us. I don't know if y'all know. <laughs> they don't like us. So he wore white Levi's and a sweater and carried some books in order to pass for a college student. He also took a seat near the door in case he should need to make a fast getaway. <laughs> in his own words, he was stunned by the size of the gathering and overwhelmed by the enthusiasm of their singing and the spirit of their prayer. At the first opportunity, he hastened to the telephone to urge his father to come see for himself how the spirit was really at work here. And as a result of his experience, Douglas himself was led to do some soul searching. And you would think that soul searching would have brought him back home to the only church that Jesus Christ founded. Right? Wrong. That's not what happened. He had been brought up as a Pentecostal, but like many others of his generation, had lost the enthusiasm which characterized his elders. Many of their ways embarrassed him. Like what? The chicken walk? Slithering around on the ground like a snake? What? Which part? <laughs> and he was content to note the beginnings. I shouldn't make fun of people. I'm sorry, Lord. I can't help it. Um, it's, it's too much. Like, it, it's, it's too much. I should probably stop researching this and just do penance. That's probably the safest bet here. <sighs> All right. So he was content to note the beginnings of a new sophistication. In the Pentecostal communities, even though in the same process, they were also losing their zeal. The meeting at Notre Dame shocked Douglas into the realization that the Holy Spirit had grown somewhat dead in his own life. Oh God, do something. Set me on fire again, he prayed. Within months, the gift of the Spirit became operative in his life. And the following year, he decided to devote himself full time to evangelistic ministry. Gotta get more apostles for the fake church. On Saturday evening of the Michigan State weekend, there was held a prayer meeting that is still remembered as a high water mark. It began about 7.30 p.m. and was not completely over until 3 a.m. Wow, talk about a party. Woodstock indeed. I'd have been sleeping, passed out on the floor by 9 a.m. 9 p.m. The prayers did not continue unbroken for seven and one half hours. Yikes. There was a coffee break as usual, and the meeting ended officially about 12.30 a.m., but most of the people there were reluctant to leave because they have a problem with obedience, and we just see this play out on a national Asbury revival type level. Same thing, y'all. Same thing. So anyway, they didn't want to leave. They remained to talk, pray, and sing together for another hour or more. There was no special event to explain the unusual character of the evening nor were there any extraordinary speeches that fired up the participants, but somehow the presence of God seemed to be felt, again with these feelings, more deeply than usual, and the dingy room in which the meeting was held seemed to be filled with a sea of joyous love. <laughs> First of all, what is the definition of love? Anyone know? Look it up. It's not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Love is an act of the will. Love requires sacrifice. Love requires pain. Love requires a decision. It is not a feeling. Several people were reminded of, now you know why we have such an issue with marriage. Why the divorces are so high, even in amongst Catholics. Because people are chasing feelings. Several people were reminded of St. Peter's words on Mount Tabor. Lord, it is good for us to be here. Matthew 17, 4. You know who uses scripture? Satan uses a lot of scripture. Jesus taught us that in the scriptures. We'll go back and read during his little um, period in the desert. 
It occurred to others that heaven must be something like such a gathering. One person remarked that he could now now begin to understand how in heaven everyone will be beautiful and will fit in harmoniously with the others, even though each one will retain his own distinctive looks and personality. During these privileged moments, it became almost visible how God was guiding each life toward its own fulfillment. It's not towards his fulfillment, towards their own fulfillment, while fitting all lives together into one great pattern of incredible beauty. It was as though each individual were the main character in a drama of his own and at the same time a supporting character in the dramas of many other lives. So many things happened that night to so many people. It would be impossible to narrate them all. One story which stood out will be told here to represent all the others. It concerns a priest who, sadly, it does, who belonged neither to Notre Dame nor to Michigan State. He lived in a city far away where he was chaplain at a high school. He was extremely active and an apostolic man. He had thrown himself unservedly into every kind of social project that might bring Christ to others. Nearly all the social agencies in the city knew him, and he organized very various social actions of his own, so a social justice warrior for the church. Yet he felt constantly frustrated at the slender results achieved. He was also a man of prayer. And this is great. Even before entering the seminary, he had been used to spending hours before the Blessed Sacrament. But now he longed for a deeper form of prayer. I'm not sure that there is a deeper form of prayer than the Mass or the sitting before the Blessed Sacrament. The many retreats he preached to students usually closed each day with some form of common prayer, but the emphasis tended to fall on shared reflections rather than on prayer itself, and this dissatisfied him. Wow. There came a period of depression. The pressure and tension were such that it was impossible to relax. I could hardly keep my insides from jumping out of me, he said. He began to be assailed by temptations, the like of which he had never experienced before. When he tried to pray, things only got worse. One Friday, after canceling three engagements, he received a call from a friend. I'm going to Notre Dame for a prayer session. Would you like to come along? The priest did not know just what this would mean, but somehow he felt that it was an answer from God. Not until he and his friend were on the highway did he learn the nature of the meetings he would be attending, and he was dismayed. The two of them reached Notre Dame about 10.30 p.m. on the evening of the first session. Sorry, I had a visitor. My son has the worst sleeping problems. Like, he inherits it from me. But anyway, um, so they reached Notre Dame late about 10.30 p.m. on the evening of the first session. The priest was shocked at the spectacle of all these people praying, singing, reading scripture, and talking about the spiritual events of their lives. So a Protestant gathering is what this is. All the next day, he stayed back on the edge of the group, rejecting what was going on, or at best remaining passive. Yet deep in his heart, he realized later he was being drawn by God. He wanted so much to love God more, to give himself fully to God, and to do more for him. All noble, um, noble, noble um, longings. After the Saturday evening meeting had officially ended at about 1 a.m., when people were still milling about, a student approached him and asked him whether he had been prayed over. No, he replied. Are you, you are afraid of it, are you? I'm not afraid of anything, was his bold answer, but deep inside he really was. And so maybe he should have listened to that. <laughs> Nevertheless, he consented to let several of the students pray over him. As they told the story later, they prayed for a while and nothing seemed to happen. Finally, they quit and went for some coffee, but as the priest himself told the story the next day, it was different. After those boys had prayed for a few moments, he said, and as and as I consented to ask God really to love me more and to take over my whole life, I felt a strange sensation of warmth gradually be, um, beginning to pervade my whole being. I had never felt anything like this before. I don't think I gave any external sign of what was happening, but the boys seemed to perceive it because as soon as it began, they stopped praying and left me alone. Never had I experienced my uniqueness and freedom of will more forcefully. I was in complete control of my will, and as, and as I would give myself to God more fully, all the more would this warmth and awareness of God's immediate presence grow stronger. 
Finally, I just gave in and felt tears rush out of my eyes. I smiled. Then, unexpectedly, my hands began to be lifted up into the air by some invisible force. It was certainly, I w- it was certainly not myself. I just sat and observed as a spectator. I felt that I could have stopped it if I wanted, but why stop a good thing? They rose up into the air and then stopped of their own accord, held out there before my face in a gesture of worship. How long they remained there, I do not know, perhaps 10 minutes. Finally, as mysteriously as they had been lifted up, my hands returned to my sides. Then I felt myself bending forward. I bent all the way down until my forehead touched the floor. At that instant, I began to pray. Several times my hands were raised and lowered in this fashion. I was completely unaware of others around me. My mind and person were so immediately in the presence of God, I was so totally absorbed in his person and in his presence that I didn't want to do anything but pray or whatever it was I was doing. So he even admits that it wasn't, he doesn't even know if it was true prayer. I felt drunk. I felt totally anew. I don't know how to say it, but something had happened. I experienced a new reality in my life I had never before experienced. We must have left the building about 2 a.m., but I continued to pray in my room until at least 4.30. The same experience was repeated there, so he doesn't know if he's actually praying or not. I even found it hard to go to sleep, and when I awoke, this new awareness of God's presence and his warmth were still with me. Most of the retreatants had an unusually short sleep that night, but many noticed that there was they were not sleepy in the morning. An observation that was to be repeated often in similar circumstances during the months that followed. Sunday Mass was offered in the chapel of Kavanaugh Hall, um, which the chapel, as we learn later, was dedicated to the Holy Spirit. The celebrant of the Mass was surprised to see the people smile spontaneously as they came up to receive communion. So here we have our first weird behavior in Mass, which will continue on. And now we have LGBTQ Masses. We have German priests having satanic ma- satanic displays in front of the Blessed Sacrament. All kinds of things. Started with a smile. Unusual as this reaction was, it seemed appropriate and beautiful in the circumstances. It was amusing to note that several strangers who had come in when they saw Mass being celebrated were immediately distinguishable by their unsmiling faces. According to the plans that had been made, the retreat was supposed to end with that Mass, but again, there's a problem with obedience with this movement. Instead, however, the group was led by a common urge to hold just one more prayer meeting. They went to the old college where they could barely squeeze into the largest room. This meeting was very quiet. The spirit of God seemed to be even more present than the night before, but in a gentler, purer way. People spoke freely, but quietly and briefly, and most of their comments were followed by moments of prayerful reflection. Halfway through this gratuitous meeting, one of the graduate students from Notre Dame quietly spoke out in tongues to the whole group. After declaring that he had been resisting, I don't know how people didn't laugh. Like, seriously, if someone tried to speak to me in tongues, I would laugh in your face. Maybe that makes me unholy. I don't know. I don't think so. I think you look ridiculous. And I don't think the Holy Spirit makes people look ridiculous, like, in this way. I'm sorry. I mean, maybe in the ways so much as, like, saints in the past have done ridiculous things, like, extreme penance and stuff like that. But, like, that had a purpose. Like, there's no purpose behind this. But apparently they say... Um, he spoke in tongues. There was a moment of hushed prayerful wonderment and then another student gave the interpretation, but they just make the interpretations up or or whatever. It was a prayer calling upon all the beauties of spring to praise the Lord. (laughs) Hippies, man. The day was in fact lovely. The first real spring day of that year. The prayer itself was astonishingly beautiful, yet the one who voiced it spoke so fast that the most gifted poet or practiced impromptu artist could not have composed such a piece with such rapidity. And I always find it interesting. um, Many, many of the world's most magnificent artists and poets and things like that have been inspired by bad forces, believe it or not. Seriously. One of the visitors expressed the sense of the whole... Uh, visitors expressed a sense of the whole weekend when he pointed out movingly how much it had meant to him to discover that 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10 was not divided in two by a period after him, 
as the old translation had it. So here we go, changing scripture, but should read as a single sentence. So this college kid or whoever is telling us that scripture is wrong. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the hearts of men conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. God has revealed to us through the Spirit. So I guess he's saying there shouldn't have been something. It was not divided in two by a period after him as the old translations had it. Okay, so he's saying there shouldn't have been a period after him. So what God has prepared for those who love him, period, is how it was written. God has revealed to us through the Spirit. Finally, the grace of prophecy, here we go with the prophets, y'all, was given to a member of this group. So this has all, this new religion has all of the bells and whistles of real Catholicism, their own prophets, their own interpretation of scripture, their own um, way to pray, um, et cetera, et cetera. Only they stayed within the infrastructure of the church and reinvented the church instead of Like the other Protestants of old leaving and setting up their own denominations, this was um, to stay in the church, to revolutionize the church. And that's exactly what happened. So apparently this is what the first, the prophecy was over here. The exact words of his prophecy are no longer remembered, but the sense of it was, this is only the beginning, says the Lord. You are going to see even greater works than these. Dun, dun, dun. All right. So the next, um, it gets into the publicity at Michigan that this caused, um, which is interesting. So the Michigan State, and this video is going to probably drag on, um, the Michigan State weekend put the prayer group in the news and soon people were speaking of a Pentecostal movement. The two student publications at the university printed sensational accounts of the weekend retreat. The scholastic used for its cover photo a beautiful mosaic of the dove descending upon the head of Jesus as he was being baptized. The article within, however, was an impressionistic account, uh, dramatized in cinema style. It emphasized the diabolic and closed with an appraisal by a Notre Dame theologian. This man, who had not attended any of the meetings, described the baptism in the spirit as an emotional explosion comparable to the ecstasy of a young man infatuated with a girl under the headline spiritualists claim gift of tongues at exorcism rites the um the observer featured a lurid photograph of a head over which many hands were extended with rigid outstretched fingers its account was full of inaccuracies it alluded for example to nine visiting ministers of the south bend full gospel businessmen's fellowship one of whom was said to have preached on the gifts of the spirit The student reports were echoed, but with much more uh, discretion by the National Catholic Reporter. The following week, the South Bend Tribune, in an article on hints of student ferment at Notre Dame, featured the use of drugs by some students. I was going to say, all it's missing from this Woodstock is the weed, (laughs) LSD, whatever they did. What did they do? Acid? Um, Maybe they were doing that. That's No, I'm just kidding, but... Hints of the student uh, ferment at Notre Dame featured the use of drugs by some students and then added a few paragraphs about the Antioch weekends and the Pentecostal movement, giving the impression that all three were somehow connected. This led to an editorial in Our Sunday Visitor, which described the Pentecostal movement as a new religious movement by hippies who reject Orthodox Catholicism. Somebody got it right. (laughs) Thank you. Oh, it's not that they reject ortho well they do, but they want to corrupt Orthodox Catholicism. They want to change it. Um, so anyway, they suffered surprisingly few repercussions for it. And it goes on to talk about the public side of things would happen. Um, but I'm gonna end it here for tonight because I'm just quite frankly tired of reading about this craziness. It's madness. It's pure chaos. Madness, chaos, false sacraments, false inverted pilgrimages to universities. Like, what? Um, anyway, very interesting. So I'm going to end it here. Joan of Arc Media.